big six of the April 95 seven day retreat in Springwater. Yesterday in the afternoon group meeting, questions came up about altered states of consciousness. I remember in particular two people talking about it, both of them having undergone times of intense spiritual training, like one person reported having to sit for 16 hours a day with the urge, I don't know whether it was just the urge or the prohibition to go, not to go to sleep, prohibition to go to sleep, the urge not to go to sleep. Another person undergone a rigorous Zen training And the appearance of what one person called altered states of consciousness, the other person calling it very spacey, very quiet. Sort of floating like. Both seem to agree that it was pleasant and that there was a desire to keep it that way. To get that back. The peacefulness of it, the tranquility of it. And this morning, someone who is familiar with hypnosis, has undergone training and I had a very brief meeting, but don't know whether the person himself does hypnosis. Mentioned how the first time in the first training movie that people had to attend, in which there was on a, on a big screen a movie of a person hypnotizing herself, going into a trance state that he himself felt pervaded by tranquility, just watching us on the wide screen, which persisted for quite a while, this tranquility. He also mentioned how in hypnosis, the eyes have to be closed. There has to be some rep repetitive thing going on, attending maybe to the breathing or being directed toward repetitive things. He did say when the eyes open up, it's different. It's not the same as when they're closed. The trance is deeper, if I understood him right. And the question that came up is, is, is are we doing something like this here? At least it was implied. We had too little time to really go into it, patiently, carefully, spaciously. But I think I heard that right, this, this questioning. Is this what is going or can potentially go on? And it's never been clearer to me before as right now that this is one of the essential reasons not to give any repetitive practices, to ins not to insist on them, to direct someone in a guided meditation. I always felt like there is an inherent danger in this. Or to demand umpteen hours of sitting, no sleep, all of that has, that has always appeared very, very dangerous, potentially very tricky. Even though the 
product, a temporary product, can be states of bliss or tranquility. Trance. I've never myself been in a trance. I don't know anything about it, what it is, what it is like. I've never taken drugs, uh, mind-altering drugs. So I'm very inexperienced in this. But I can say this about this state that we touch upon at times, try to put it into words, which is so difficult. That opening the eyes does not change it. Or getting up, the one person said, when that state is there or was there, one doesn't want to get up, one doesn't want it to stop. But getting up does not change it. Looking around does not change it. The world looks different, although it's this, the same flower, the same floor, and yet it's seen freshly, without imagery, without fear or desire, that being in abeyance. Not through some method or technique of tranquilizing the brain. It is as though the brain voluntarily went into quietness. It's quiet and yet not part of it drugged out or part of it tranquilized through method of any kind. It, it appears as though the whole brain is alive and well and active but quiet, quietly pursuing whatever it needs to pursue. It's involved in everything, heartbeat, metabolism, blood circulation, so forth. So we were talking this morning how, how easy it is to suggest things, to imagine things, what happened to one, what one is, what others are. And of course, the, uh, that's one thing I've used to read some about. I was fascinated by, fascinated by it, post-hypnotic suggestions because it came up in the study of psychology. Under the, in, in the state of hypnosis induced by the hypnotizer or hypnotist, hypnotist can tell the subject to do certain things and the subject will get up and do them. It is influ deeply influenced by the orders given by the hypnotist. Again, this has nothing to do with the state of openness. One would not be in that danger to be influenced by someone telling one strange things to do, strange things to remember or to imagine because imagery becomes transparent. What is imagery is transparently seen for not being the real thing but imagery. That is its reality, imagery. Something just occurs as an aside. Um, hypnotists, uh, psychologists were interested, how far would a, a hypnotized subject go to even endanger herself, himself, a student uh, subject? And they devised a tank of snakes. <laughs> we can devise and imagine anything. A tank of snakes and the hypnotist would ask the subject to reach into that. But there was a protective <laughs> device, so couldn't really touch the snakes, but that was not visible. And as I remember it, this and other experiments about doing something dangerous did not work. The subject would not do that enough sense left. Sometimes we wonder whether enough sense is left and what, <laughs> what we do under the impact of imagination, the horrible things to each other, imagining to do good and necessary things, including self-aggrandizement. 
So, uh, the question also came up in another group. Someone asked, in a completely different connection, which I don't remember, the context. Since there's this tremendous potential and actuality of deceiving ourselves, isn't this why it is always said one needs a teacher to check out whether one is deceiving oneself or not? My response was, how, how does one know that the teacher is not deceiving herself or himself? It's a very tricky thing. But not to go too much into hypothetical stuff. Here we are. If there is a state or an insight or whatever one wants to check out, let's discuss it. Let's look at it together. Say something. And we'll look at it. Because in this state of, what shall I call it, no division, openness, no illusion, illusion becomes very visible, very transparent, as it may come up in oneself or as it ever is evident in the other. But only in that state, of course, if we are both participating in illusion, we we'll reinforce each other's illusions. Ultimately, the proof, if you will, can only lie in oneself. And yet it's a tricky business, because we delude ourselves so skillfully, not intentionally, the brain does it all, and the body complies imagining something and not seeing imagination. And then again, the beautiful thing, the miracle is that it's possible to see illusion as that, or imagery. One, one person mentioned, how was it? He said he, he found imagining or rehearsing what he would say to people back home about this retreat. It all sounds familiar. <laughs> One can also rehearse, what will I say to Tony when I come into the room, rehearsing it in the line or wherever. And then suddenly, seeing that going on. It's so simple, not easy, but it's simple, it happens. Seeing that rehearsing is going on, and then a comment happening this is all insubstantial stuff. And then seeing it as insubstantial stuff. Not just the comment, but the actuality of the insubstantiality of image about home and what I'm going to say. And this is the fine line between a clear imagination and seeing that imagination clearly as such, not condemning it, rejecting it, accepting it, that's all more thought. As to these pleasant states that can result from past or present repetitive practices, that the brain responds well to repetition. Parents know who sing lullabies to babies or rock them gently, rhythmically. If one has practiced mantras or repeated, repeated koans, one, one knows this tranquilizing effect that repetition has on the brain. So, how can I tell whether this is something real, this state of tranquility, or something induced? Already talking about it this way may be of help, because one has a question to ask. 
Is it real? Is it induced? And remembering from readings that were given during our Zen training, it's amazing how the old masters kept warning, <coughs> kept warning about these states. Remember one word just popped in the mind a little while ago, warning about the deep pit of pseudo-emancipation. Or when another one was writing something like, I don't have it verbatim anymore, if one comes into a clear space as open as the sky, not to stop there, to grab it, to think this is it, Because then there is the grabber, the wanter, the enjoyer of it, the keeper or the producer of it. So, if one is really interested whether states like this which occur during one's sitting, of what nature they are, then one can look. Is, is there some effort at controlling it, so maybe some very subtle effort to produce this thing, to keep it going, and some subtle fear to lose it. And if that question is asked with interest, and a real urge to, to, to find out the truth of it, then what is going on can reveal itself the subtle effort made, the desire, the fear, and the one who has all of that, which is an illusion in itself made up of thinking, enormously effective, rigid, old thinking patterns, which divide us from ourselves, or from the truth of ourselves. In this connection, another thing comes to mind that was said this morning. I don't know what connection it has, really. We'll see. We'll look at it. Someone saying, I've really found that there is nothing inside. was a reference to Krishnamurti talking about the inner shallowness or inner emptiness as though implied in looking at that inner emptiness or shallowness there was something beyond. Again, please, I am incapable of quoting verbatim, but the thing in itself as it is formulated now is worth looking at even though it may not be precisely what was said in the meeting. So the inner shallowness, the inner hollowness or emptiness, this person said, is a fact. It is so. There is nothing inside. It's true. So again, it, it connects with what we said before. Is that a limited state of seeing the truth of inner emptiness? That nothing is to be found inside. Nothing but words and habits and ideas. That's plenty of it is there. And pains and pleasures. But being with a feeling of inner hollowness or emptiness, one finds nothing. to grab onto. What is that state? The person said, this is true, there is nothing inside. 
But is there an inside and an outside? I'm not saying that was implied. I'm asking it freshly now. Is there an inside and the outside and a separation between the two? Because this inner hollowness that we ache from and suffer from and want to constantly fill has to do with the idea of myself as separate from others. And that's worthwhile looking at, examining what its roots are, its roots being. Find out for yourself, I've looked at it, the sense of separation, the fear of being alone, making for this feeling of hollowness. Noth nothing to hope for. Nothing interesting to do. Nothing to believe in one person. Said, I don't have a belief or faith. And it sort of feels like a lack. Is that, that inner state with nothing in it, is that a feeling of lack? Let's look at it. Because lack implies me lacking something. A thought-created entity with a thought-created lack. And this inner shallowness or hollow emptiness not to be confused with the insubstantiality of everything. When the mind is quiet, open, perceptive, purely perceptive, not in terms of a person needing something or fearing something. That doesn't make for pure perception. That distorts it or abolishes it. Just pure listening, without the effort to create a listening space. It's there. And listening, not separate from space. watch the mind is does it create ideas and images about this see it wanting it the image triggering the desire for it what if I had that or poor me I don't have it or jealous me of the others who have it to see that to see it as it works in its insubstantial way like these windows on the computer. A window upon a window upon a window upon what? <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing about the computer is, or the tricky thing, you can delete the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> Would if it were that easy to delete painful imagery. <laughs> Question come up, do you really want to delete this? <laughs> what would we say? <laughs> Maybe no. Because <laughs> we want to feel important, don't we? Somehow or other. Existing. We think we are obliged to exist as something or somebody. I may all be false assumption. We can question it. We're free. We are, this moment, free to hear the, the fan coming on and the breathing taking place and people moving, not in order to induce a trance state, but it's there.
stomach gurgling and, and birds twittering and breathing, sensations. No need to relate to it. It's there. Who's relating? Thought is relating. Telling stories. Is it? See it as just a story. There's nothing real about it. Is the fan and the birds twittering? Is that real? It's twittering. It's fanning. It's breathing. A deep one. Are we here? Right now? Before we know it, just here, ness, nowness. Without an immediate need to know. And if the label comes up, see it as a label. And the fan is still humming. We will end here for today.